Hello, everybody. Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Series. My name is Daniel Levinson Wilk. I teach American history here at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce two stars of the fashion studies world. Jonathan Michael Square is assistant professor at Parsons School of Design and a fashion historian. Um, Elizabeth Way is the associate curator and associate curator at MFIT. And they both are amazing scholars. I think Jonathan, I'll leave it to you to talk about Elizabeth's latest uh, success later. So I won't say anything about that now. Um, I also just wanted to say a word about a series that this event is part of. It's part of the 1863-1963-2023 project, Civil Rights in FIT's Neighborhood. Um, and the idea was that this is the year of the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington and the 160th anniversary of the draft riots. And FIT has a connection to both of these events that most people don't know about. During the draft riots in 1863, uh, when a mob of racist whites came up against the government, they were protesting the military draft, and they ransacked and destroyed the homes of abolitionists, they fought pitched battles in the streets with the police, and they lynched many people, including a man named Abraham Franklin, who was dragged from his house on the corner of 7th Avenue and 27th Street as he was trying to protect his mother and killed in the street. A hundred years later, the March on Washington was planned from an office in Harlem, but also from a few apartments across 8th Avenue from FIT in what's called Penn South. Um, Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph, the two organizers of the march, lived there, and other people who were involved were there also. Evidently, Bob Dylan spent a lot of time there in the lead up to the March on Washington. And David Dubinsky, who we have a, name, a building named after here at FIT, was the president of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union and donated half of the money for the sound system through which Dr. King spoke of his dream. So here at FIT, we are sort of at the intersection of what might be the worst and the best moments in the history of civil rights, and we thought you should know. So we're bringing you this event and a bunch of other events. There's on the table up by the entrance a flyer that lists a whole bunch of other events. I see a couple of people picked it up already. Um, so please come see more if you'd like. Uh, at the end of this presentation, we will bring the speakers the questions from the audience using the cards that were distributed to you during check-in. I ask you please to silence your devices, and please join me in welcoming Jonathan Michael Square and Elizabeth Way. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you all for being with us here tonight, and thank you, Jonathan, for joining us from Parsons. Of course. So today we, um, you know, in the context of the 1863-1963-2023 project, we are going to do a talk that looks at this time period, mostly the first 100 years, um, and think about the role that fashion and style has played in black civil rights. Um, Jonathan is an expert in this area, and so we're going to speak to a number of images to kind of think about um, fashion and style's role and how it's evolved. So we're going to start with our first image and take a look at this one. So obviously, hopefully this is a very recognizable image. And we wanted to start off thinking about some really, um, some images that have really had a lot of circulation um, in our time and think about what the role of protest is. So Jonathan, what do you think? Yeah, this is a recently discovered art visit of Harriet Tubman. And I think we, when we look, often see Harriet Tubman, she's mm -hmm. often very stoic and less fashion conscious. And this is a more like younger, more sort of, um, vain, vain in a positive sense. Yeah, <laughs> um, stylized. Stylish, exactly, yeah. of Harriet Tubman. So I think it forces us to have a more multifaceted vision of Harriet Tubman. She was complicated. She, yeah. she married twice. She lived for a long time. She was, there was a moment where she was very fashion conscious. And I think this was a re really important image because we had a very sort of ossified vision of Harriet Tubman in this image makes us think differently about her. I really love how there's like, it just opens up a new, a new perspective on a historical figure that we think we know so well. This image of Harriet Tubman is so kind of used in culture over and over. Um, and to have different perspectives of her life and her positioning in society, I think is really important to think about people as whole people and not just as kind of the images that we understand today. This is another image that I think is really, really well circulated. Yeah. I I think 
Sojourner Truth, of all the early like civil rights activists and abolitionists, has the most interesting personal style. It's the, very specific. You always see her this way. I mean, I think it it helps. I think what contributes to that is there's not, not that many pictures of her. Mm -hmm. But this is a very specific style. Can you break it down for us a little? Yeah, she had a sort of quirky, idiosyncratic way of dressing that like referenced a little bit of Quakerism, does a little bit of like performance dress. You can see some of her feminist ideals. She didn't like super corseted outfits. She wanted to be free. She wanted to be able to move. She also wore interesting prints like polka dots. So we see like, ref uh, like maybe influence from the reform movement. She was obviously such a big um, women's rights advocate. And so we see all of these ideas about women's dressing and fashion and how it intersected with those political those political movements. But also, you know, I think the head wrap is such a quintessentially black kind of um, look, especially in the 19th century. And the way she kind of reclaims it as a free woman, I think is really important. Um, and drawing connections across the diaspora in, the, in North America, but also um, on Africa, in Europe. Um, I think it's such a key kind of intersection for black style. And she also, she often would sell like part of his of herself that said, I sell the shadow to support the substance. So she was very much aware that she was, her physical presence was part of her activism. And speaking of that, I think this is the perfect embodiment of that, the most photographed man of the 19th century. Um, I, and we're gonna talk a little bit about Du Bois too, but I really find this connection between these two figures because the way they dress is so kind of intrinsic to kind of the way they projected themselves in terms of class. Absolutely, I mean, you all know this, but Frederick Douglass was the most photographed man in the 19th century, more than any American president. And I think that's pretty astounding the way he sort of wielded that technology. I mean, he was very, very conscious of like kind of producing, like fighting back against this technology of power that was used against black people in so many different ways. You know, from caricatures, from scientific, quote unquote scientific images, um, very conscious and kind of using this technology to push back and to create positive images. What I also love about his look is that it's very dramatic. Mm. I mean, he's obviously a pretty good looking person. Um, I don't think we talk about that enough. <laughs> but um, he was very conscious of, you know, his image circulating in the American public and how it would kind of precede him in terms of his speaking, in terms of his activism, in the same way that Sojourner Truth was selling images of herself. And not only that, like he used photography, but he also wrote about photography. He yeah. wrote two important essays on photography and its use in like democracy. What, what, was, what were his points? That it was, he, he felt like photography was like a democratic tool. It's, instead of painting or drawing, which sort of was used in like depict African Americans as caricatures. Photographs could like really capture the essence of black people and their beauty. And in our next image, we're gonna think directly about a fashion maker, but before we get into her, I really wanna point out kind of this, this format of photography. This is a studio photograph, and if we look, there are hundreds, if not, I mean thousands of studio photographs of Americans, people all over the world in similar photographs. They're standing in this interior that is very kind of stylized, this furniture. It's meant to kind of recreate an um, 18th or earlier painting, um, 18th century or earlier painting, but it's rendered in this photographic style that was, again, democratizing. Um, all of a sudden, all these people, everyday people, could have images of themselves, um, and that wasn't possible, like, you know, up until, when was the photograph invented? Like, early 19? 1840s. 1840s, yeah. Um, but this is Elizabeth Keckley. And you wrote a chapter um, in a book recently about the intersection of fashion making and activism. Mm. Um, so do you wanna talk a little bit about uh, Keckley's role there? You're being so modest. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, you edited that book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you wrote an amazing essay and I really like the connections that you make between Keckley and some other fashion makers. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm always getting nervous talking about Keckley in front of you because you're like one of the foremost scholars of Keckley. <laughs> but I, I, what I really appreciate about Keckley is that like a lot of the things that I focus on in my research, she sort of embodies. Mm -hmm. um, an enslaved woman bought the freedom of, both her freedom and the freedom of her son, moves to Washington, D.C. And not only does she become an important prominent dressmaker, she also uses the funds from her dressmaking business to support abolitionist causes and the cause of um, freed people. And so I always make the assumption that she made the clothes that she was photographed in. If not, 
made them herself, definitely had a big hand in kind of directing her dressmaker. So I really see the intersection of her fashion practice and her kind of self-presentation is very closely entwined. But some of the other things that I really find inspiring, you say, you know, she was, um, she was an abolitionist. She was a fundraiser um, for what they called contraband um, people. And during the Civil War, these were um, enslaved people who self-emancipated and moved um, north. And so she was, you know, raising funds to support them. But I think it's also perhaps easier to overlook that she ran a business. She trained and employed other black women. Um, and she really created a niche for herself within kind of Washington, D.C. society in the 1860s. She's really well known for being kind of Mary Lott, Todd Lincoln's best friend. They were very, very close. Um, but my favorite fact about her is that she was the dressmaker to Verena Davis as well, who was Jefferson Davis's wife. So she was definitely on both sides of, you know, very kind of plugged into what was happening in the polit political situation leading up to the Civil War. So she was very savvy um, as well. You know what I, oh sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> She's also a beautiful writer. I, I love assigning her book. And because she wrote this memoir, it's called um, Behind the Scenes, Four Years, of, uh, no, it's 40 Years a Slave and Four Years in the White House. Mm -hmm. um, it's available online. Um, we only know about her because she left this memoir. She was able to tell her own story. And she learned how to read and write from her mother, and she also learned her dressmaking skills from her mother. So this idea of black women passing down kind of this agency through the skills that they're able to teach, I think is a really important kind of thread in the intersection of dressmaking and activism. You know what I want you to do? What? I want you to write the authoritative biography of Elizabeth Keckley. There's actually, an, actually a really good biography that's written, a dual biography of her and Mary Todd Lincoln. That's oh. really well researched. Okay. So I focus more on her fashion kind of output and her kind of, but there, so there is one. Okay. <laughs> um, our next image is, so we're jumping ahead just a little bit. Um, Elizabeth Keckley was working and that photograph was taken in the 1860s. And we're jumping ahead about 30 years to look at um, Mary Church Terrell. And what I really want to focus on here is the idea of respectability politics. So she was a club woman. Um, she was a member of a racial uplift club, which was a very popular um, kind of uh, social and political pursuit of middle class black women at this time. And the idea of respectability politics was tied to specifically the women's club movement by an amazing um, historian named Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Um, who invented the term respectability politics. Um, but talk to me about this image and what she's kind of communicating to you through this. You know, I think she's sort of, I'm, I think about respectability politics, but I also think about Du Bois' idea of the talented 10th. Mm -hmm. And I think Mary Church Terrell sort of embodies both of those ideals. And you see it so in I'm gonna, this. So I'm going to stop really quickly, just in case. So the respectability politics is this idea that um, it was really in, advocated by middle class black Americans that if black American people as an entirety could emulate middle class white society, that would insulate them from discrimination. And of course, respectability politics is very much at play in our society today. And the talented 10th was a concept that W.E.B. Du Bois um, kind of conceptualized as kind of the elite black Americans, and that these would be the people who would lead the black American population um, into the future. So, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. I mean, what I would add is that, um, just the very act of being photographed was still, um, not everyone could afford to be photographed. I mean, over the course of the 19th century, it became more and more affordable. But the very fact that there's multiple image of her that we still have mm -hmm. um, sort of you know, talks about the amount of privilege that she, that she had. And one of the things that I love about Terrell, who was a, she was, she was a, a writer, she was um, a activist, she gave a lot of speeches, she gave, did a lot of fundraising, um, is that she, was a huge proponent of this idea of respectability. And so much of this was driven by um, the Great Migration and black people from the rural South or Southern cities moving to these Northern cities and kind of bringing their own kind of ways of dressing and habits and demeanors with them. And this caused a lot of tension between different classes of black people in the city, um, mostly because the influx of the, the the rise of the black population was drawing a lot more attention to black people in these cities. And so these residents who'd been there for generations are all of a sudden feeling this discrimination when it, in the past they were able to kind of hide because of their low numbers. So what I like about respectability is that it's really a conversation within black communities, even though it's kind of centered on the white gaze. It's really a discourse, a social discourse in which black people are really trying to find their place in American society. And this is a generation after slavery, sometimes not even that, 
And fashion is such an important way in which they're establishing it. And so you can understand why respectability was an idea that people thought would work. Um, and so these women, these club women, they were huge proponents of respectability politics, and Ida B. Wells is another one. But they also had all of these other activities in their activism that kind of like went against the grain. So even if we look at this picture of her, she's like kind of leaning on one elbow, like not quite sitting up straight. I feel like you get a little bit of attitude through this. And Ida B. Wells was, she just kind of broke out of all of the kind of the, the restraints that women, black women especially, but women were supposed to be living in, um, in the 19th and early 20th century. Tell us a little bit more about Ida B. Wells. Yeah, I mean, just to go back to your idea of respectability, I think Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell, and honestly, pretty much everyone we're gonna talk about tonight has to negotiate respectability politics, whether they conform to ideas of respectability or they flouted ideas of respectability. And I think Ida B. Wells sort of told that line, there's moments where she flouted respectability, but there's also moments where she sort of completely conformed to it. And in these pictures, these are so, what's interesting about these pictures is if you don't know anything about these people, they're almost like these perfect images of these middle and upper class people. Um, you know, someone like Mary Church Terrell is so light, her complexion is so light that she almost can look white. And a lot of the people that we'll look um, at and that you see images of black people at this period um, kind of fit into that description. Um, but when you learn about them, you see all the ways in which respectability doesn't actually operate in the real world. So Ida B. Wells was a journalist, and she embarked on this national anti-lynching campaign. Her original newspaper was in Nashville, right? It was in Tennessee. Um, and you know, it was attacked, it was taken apart, she had to flee to New York. Um, the New York Age newspaper, which was like the largest black newspaper in the country, was based here. They let her have this platform. Um, but she was doing like, you know, she was, getting kicked off of trains when she was trying to like desegregate, um, you know, segregated cars. She was doing all of this really courageous stuff. Um, and when we look at the image, it's so, it's because of our associations of what 19th century women look like, it really belies kind of those actions. So you are definitely the expert on Du Bois. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this and tell us a little bit specifically, not just about him, but this image specifically and how it's been altered. I could spend the rest of this presentation talking about this one image easily. But I, think, I mean, what sticks out to me, um, I, this image was used in an exhibition that was at FIT on pockets. Mm -hmm. And m the grad students focused on like, the fact that he had his hands in his pocket and that, that posture. I think he's trying to convey a sense of authority, but also a sense of ease. Mm -hmm. And I think photos from this era, like the turn of the century, is when you start seeing candid-esque photos. And this is meant to be a candid even though it's very much staged. Um, another thing that really sticks out to me is that it was doctored. Um, if you look really closely at the photograph, the, the, line, the seam along the vest, someone took, sort of took a ballpoint pen and sort of drew in the seam, like the creases are also drawn in. So he was very much, you know, thinking about his image even after the photograph was taken, um, thinking about his legacy. And that's, I think, what's so interesting about photography is that, you know, we have Photoshop now, which is obviously can, create these monumental changes, but there were always ways in which you could kind of add to the photo or scrape away at the negative and kind of like, you know, change the image. It was always this thing that, um, that post-production was always an element of this image that you were presenting. But he not only was invested in kind of photography of himself, he was invested in photography on a much kind of larger scale. So tell us about the Paris exhibition. Yeah, so Du Bois was involved in curating an exhibition that was in Paris in 1900 called the American Negro Exhibit. Um, and the point of this exhibition was to change the vision, the view, stereotypes against African Americans. And so there are um, over 100 images of African Americans, many of them portraits, mm -hmm. but also sort of um, scenes inside of homes or churches or schools. And the idea was to show African Americans in a positive light. Um, of course, this is the era of scientific racism and pseudoscience and um, there was a lot of um, negative stereotypes and caricatures of African Americans, so it was meant to show African Americans in a positive light. And, you know, this was, you know, the world's fairs at the turn of centuries. There were still human zoos. Absolutely. They're still, like, you know, bringing people from the continent and putting them in kind of pseudo villages for people to tour. Um, and, you know, Frederick Douglass specifically talks about how, like, he, how much he hated that ju juxtaposition of, you know, what black Americans are trying to create is this picture of modern, modern citizenship mm -hmm. and how they were being kind of thrown in this light. And I mean, in a way that was very kind of, you know, 
indicative of his colonialist view as an American, mm -hmm. but that these like you know people from Dohomey and other places were really negative images of mm -hmm. Black people. Um, what I love about this image is like we think about kind of the new woman or the Gibson girl and these women, and so many of these images were students at um, in uh, colleges in Atlanta. So he really privileges these young, kind of um, you know good looking, um, really healthy and well educated Black people as a way to counter these stereotypes, but this is such an amazing image. It's actually used in a book called The History of Modern Fashion since 1850, just to illustrate this kind of new fashion, the separates, um, you know, the way women were dressing. And I think it's so important to think about black women as, black men and women as real kind of conversance in the way American fashion is changing at this time. But also thinking about what you said about skin color, a lot of the um, subjects that he chose for his exhibition were white passing. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a little bit of colorism in that choice, but also he was, I think he was trying to force people to think more expansively about race. About what blackness could look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. So our next image, so we're gonna jump ahead a little bit to World War One because we have these images of black soldiers and, but I didn't include it here, but there's a much more famous image of a black soldier um, and really kind of ex um, documenting his experience when he came home. Can you tell us a little bit about that image, or do you want me to? You can do it. <laughs> okay, so it's an image, I actually don't know the man's name, I need to look it up, but black soldiers were specifically targeted for wearing their uniforms um, after World War I. They would come home you know, from Europe um, where they experienced different kind of social dynamics around race, sometimes better, um, often better than in the United States, so certainly there were problems in Europe around race as well. Um, and there's a very famous newspaper story of a soldier whose eyes were gouged out. He was pulled off a bus. Um, you know, he flew back, he came back to the United States. He was riding a bus back down south to his home. And because he was wearing his uniform, it was seen as like a threat as he, he was, um, you know, positioning himself above his, the perceived station of his, the, the, his attackers envisioned for him. And so he was attacked and they gouged out his eyes. And the purpose of circulating this image, it was really to kind of enlist photography in the battle for civil rights to really put on view the horrific treatment that black people were going through. And the 1910s was a really bad time for black Americans. You see this surge of violence really from the 1890s through the 1920s um, after the collapse of reconstruction and just this kind of, you know, this all scale assault in so many violent ways. And these people who had obviously risked their lives to defend their country who were exercising their citizenship in that way, um, were really became the targets for this type of this type of attack. And so the uniform, the military uniform, is this archetypical kind of um, fashion statement. Obviously, it's much some other things as well. But when we think about kind of democracy in action, especially Americans overseas, the military uniform is really evocative. But the white suit is also this kind of archetype that's evocative in other ways. Absolutely. I mean, I think the color white and wearing the color white is culturally specific, and in different places it means different things. You know, I think within the African diaspora, it's often associated with spirituality. Even in Africa, it's associated with mm -hmm. spirituality. Um, and this is a very important image from 1917, um, silent protests, and um, most of the people in the parade dressed in white. And I think in this particular context, the wearing of white was um, conveyed a sense of solemnity but also um, respect and honor for like those slain due to racial violence. And we see so many connections in this time period between the suffragettes and how they were using white as a symbol of kind of their protest. And it had a lot, uh, white obviously has a lot of associations with purity, um, things that were not necessarily associated with black people, um, but it was such a powerful protest color in this time period. And we'll see how that kind of resonates today. Um, but moving forward, I wanna think a little bit about like pushing back against respectability. I mean, people have always pushed back against respectability politics, but Marcus Garvey, I think, is a really interesting character in this conversation. Yeah, he had a very unique, very, I would almost say flamboyant sense of style. He liked to incorporate like epaulets and um, sort of um, showy military headgear into his wardrobe. And it was a sign of authority and leadership, but I also think a little bit of African cosmopolitanism and I, I think that it's so interesting to position him in juxtaposition to Du Bois because they, they were like, they were not. They, they were kind of set against each other. I mean, Du Bois also kind of set himself against um, Booker T. Washington. But um, Marcus Garvey was Jamaican and he 
came to the United States um, and he was raising money and creating this back to the Af Af back to Africa movement. Something that makes me very very sad is that he actually never never went to he never got back to Africa. But he created the Black Star shipping line to like bring Black Americans black back to Africa, and he wanted to use Liberia as a kind of a foothold to create to start a war to fight colonialism and to take Africa back. Um, Liber the Liberian government did not support this, um, but his kind of flamboyance and his kind of appeal to working class people was kind of something missing from what Du Bois and even you know Booker T. Washington in a different way speaking to working class people, but that was a, a missing element. And so much of respectability was pushing back against black people who are moving to the city from the South who, you know, if you're coming to New York City, you have so many more opportunities to buy things, to shop, to have free time, to have leisure time. These people wanted to partake in this. They were much less interested in this idea of kind of being perfect to convey to white people that, you know, black people were worthy. And so I think Marcus Garvey embodies more of those ideas of speaking to working class black people, of doing things um, that are going to disrupt the system instead of kind of fold into the system. And I love this image of him. The image I often think of Garvey is he's sitting in a car and he's wearing sort of this military helmet with like the feather coming out of it. But you can see also in this image, he also sort of um, in subtle ways conform to respectability too. For sure. And I also think it's a good indication of how fashion is really changing in the 1920s. Um, we have this kind of, um, this idea of what modernity certainly from our perspective in 20, the 21st century and how that's influencing fashion at this period. And so I think that internationally, Josephine Baker is such an important figure when we think about black modernity. I also think of all the figures that we're gonna talk about tonight, Josephine Baker is most often referenced in modern fashion, whether it's Beyonce or Patrick Kelly. Yeah. And of course, there, there are other famous images of her where she's, you know, wearing her banana skirt and doing her, her dance at the Filet Bourget. Um, I chose this image because I think this is much more kind of representative of how she styled herself. The idea of the banana skirt and, you know, she was in this performance in Paris in 1925 and this uh, review and she gained so much fame and through that, a position of power that really affected her the rest of her life. She stayed in Paris almost the rest of her life. But she did this by positioning herself as this kind of primitive African, doing this dance for like this white hunter. Um, and it became her calling card. It became how she was represented in art by so many, from Picasso to Calder. So all these people re represented her this way. Um, and it was very chic and was very fashionable at this time. But it's something that she very quickly abandoned. Um, she did not want to present herself in that way. Um, she was a big couture client. She bought clothes from Poiret and Chanel. Um, and so I think that that juxtaposition, I mean, that's why she's memorable. And so many artists from Beyonce to Patrick Kelly reference the banana skirt and that idea of primitivism. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really becomes a double-edged sword when we really dig down into kind of that image. Yeah, she's totally someone who walked that line of respectability in her day-to-day -day life. It was less showy, less performative. Yeah. And it was really like in touch with kind of modernity mm -hmm. and Western fashion. So we're going to go back and think a little bit about respectability. So tell me about kind of menswear at this time and what this is saying to you um, and what it's going to kind of pretend, portend for the civil rights um, era. Absolutely. You mean all these men, I think there's one woman or two women maybe in this photograph, but it's mostly men. Um, and, you know, I, I notice the hats that they're holding in their hands. This is a moment when, you know, most men wore hats. Yeah. Like it, was, you know, it wasn't until the mid 20th century that you see people not wearing hats on a daily basis. Um, also, when I look at this image, funny enough, I think about Henry Louis Gates, who I kind of think of as being like the 21st century him, um, Du Bois, mm -hmm. and how he sort of fashions himself and sort of replicates sort of Du, du Bois's mannerisms and self-styling. Um, and he also, this is a photograph of the advisory board of the Encyclopedia of the Negro and Du Bois, I mean, sorry, Gates. Um, has realized this encyclopedia in the 21st century. I think there's a real positioning of kind of the black intellectual in this image, but I think that this is this time period is such a touch point going forward for like black male style. And also, I mean, this is shortly, I could talk about Du Bois for <laughs> forever, but I mean, a, a decade later, he's gonna, or two decades later, he's gonna be kicked out of the United States because of the Red Scare and spend the rest of his life in Ghana. 
in the photos from Ghana, you see him wearing sort of this traditional suiting, but he incorporates Kente Kauf and um, rappers. And so he sort of takes Western suiting and mixes it with African clothing, which I think is really interesting. It's really postmodern in a way that mm. I think wasn't really recognized at the time. So this is a, a, the next photo is a very personal photo to you. So tell me about this one. This is my grandfather. <laughs> 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 and honestly, I don't know much about this photograph. I, I, I didn't see it until after he was dead. Um, he died when I was 26. Um, but it's from World War II. Um, he's not in uniform, well, maybe more casual off-duty uniform. Um, he's sitting, standing in front of a, a motorcycle. And he did share stories about World War II with me, um, but he, I don't know exactly where this photograph was taken. I know he's 18 in the photo, though. But I love the styling of this. So this, I, I think this would be called fatigues as opposed to a dress uniform. Um, but the styling of this photo, there's so many kind of ideas about the technologies of power and portraying black self-presentation here. Um, from all the props to the uniform to even his posture, I think says a lot about kind of the way, kind of this aspirational idea of like how black people saw themselves versus how kind of mainstream society was viewing them. And, mil and Soldiers, military people were such a evocative, evocative group to kind of think about black Americans' place in modern society. Even thinking about the photo you showed from World War I, um, there's, a, there's a certain degree of honor and respectability that comes with military service. Oh, for sure. Um, and also, like, he was so young. I mean, it was such a formative experience for him. Um, so, yeah. So we're now we're gonna go into the civil rights period and I really feel like so much of what we talk about kind of leads into this period. But what I really, uh, the reason I chose this image out of so many images that we could have chosen out of, um, of Dr. King was, I, it's so fascinating to me in this period how the respectability and dress and kind of this idea of the Sunday best and dignity comes up against the violence that these people experienced. Yeah, I mean, wearing suiting does afford a degree of social mobility, cultural capital, but it's not gonna protect you from being beaten or manhandled or even shot. You know, a suit is not an armor, and you see it in this photo, even though he's dressed very well, very respectably, he also is being mistreated by the police. And so much of the Southern um, Conference's kind of ethos about respectability, about presenting themselves, had to do with kind of it was the Sunday best mentality that you always had to present yourself um, in the best possible way. And so maintaining that kind of look was so challenging, um, you know, when you're marching in the heat, when you're being sprayed with hoses, when you're being attacked with, by dogs, when you're being arrested. And certainly for men, it was really challenging. But we think about it for women. And one of the best, I think, pieces of um, research about this kind of uh, this period it was is by Tanisha C. Ford, who is at, she's at the, she's a CUNY. Yeah. Um, but she wrote a book, what's the name of her book? Oh, Liberated Threads. Liberated Threads. And she talks about um, you know, these women who, they would have to get their hair pressed, they were wearing girdles and stockings, and you know, they would, s for example, when they sat to um, desegregate lunch counters, people would pour ketchup and mustard on them. They would pour food on them, and they had to kind of maintain as, as much as possible. Police would throw them in the back of these paddy wagons um, and drive them around in the heat so that they would sweat and their clothes would become see-through. And like they would throw them in jail for days and they couldn't shower. And you know, there's she recalled the story of one woman. She said, the first thing I did when I got out was go to a hair salon. I needed to feel human again because of all of this dehumanizing kind of treatment that they, they experienced that specifically targeted their self-presentation. And so when we look at these images, there's obviously so much kind of when we just look at the fashion, this nostalgia about like the 1950s. But when you take kind of a larger lens, you see like the effort that it took not only to dress this way, but to kind of maintain this. The thing that sticks out for me, I also I signed a chapter from Liberated Threads this week, so I'm thinking about that reading a lot. And in this chapter, she mentions that two activists, Joyce Ladner and I think Ann Moody, um, were at this march for Washington and they didn't wear respectful dress, they wore denim, because they were members of SNCC, and we're gonna talk about that later in the presentation. But it's interesting, these kind of images are the ones that circulated because people are dressed more respectably and they thought it would have more an effect and also could sway opinions. And so I think we're gonna get into that, right? No, we're gonna talk about a little bit more about fashion makers and then we're gonna get into SNCC. 
So thinking about the mid-century and civil rights, I think one of the most important figures is Rosa Parks. Tell us about this dress. Well, in the uh, article that I wrote um, for um, um, enslaved, um, the article that I wrote on enslaved um, fashion makers that Elizabeth edited, um, I actually started off with this dress that was made by Rosa Parks. When she um, refused to give her, her seat on the bus, she was actually working on this dress at the department store that she worked at. So we think of Rosa Parks as being you know, a civil rights activist, and she absolutely was, but she was also a fashion person. Um, and she made dresses and for the department store that she worked at, but she actually made this dress for herself. And I think it's really important to kind of point out that Rosa Parks was specifically chosen to lead this protest. It wasn't spontaneous. Um, they picked, the Southern Convention picked someone who was kind of flawless in their self-presentation, in their reputation. They wa they needed someone to lead that protest that no one could point any fingers, fingers at and kind of degrade her respectability. Mm. Um, and so the fact that she was a fashion maker, I think that gives her, um, gives her insight in mm. kind of, skill in her self-presentation, or maybe even just kind of a way of thinking about it that other people don't necessarily think about. And then this is a piece by a woman named Ann Lowe, who was a dressmaker. Um, she actually worked from the 1910s through 1972 when she retired. She's most well known for making Jacqueline Kennedy's wedding dress, but she really, I think, embodies this idea of protest and fashion making in a different way. Because Throughout her career, the vast majority of her clients were white, not just white elites, like you know the DuPonts, the Rockefellers. These were kind of her clients that she built up when she was in New York. Um, but this idea of kind of um, of kind of activating in these spaces. I mean, so much of her career was about kind of helping the elite maintain their kind of rarefied world. This is a debutante dress. Um, she did a lot of debutante, a lot of wedding dresses. But existing in that space, I think, was really important to her in kind of building her idea of herself as a fashion maker. And this is the moment where I'm going to plug Liz's <laughs> exhibition at Winterthur Museum um, that's on Anlo up right now. So if you take the trip down to Wilmington, Delaware, and you can see many of these pieces in person. And it's the first exhibition of Lowe's work since 1986. But I do also want to point out this piece. So even though she was so well known as this kind of elite society dressmaker, she did have black clients. And I'm really hoping, we know uh, this is Idella Koch, who is a fundraiser and a socialite living in Harlem. She was obviously, Anlo made very expensive clothes, and so she could obviously afford them. We also know of a woman whose wedding dress um, and other pieces Anlo made in 1968. But I'm really hoping that more of her black clients are going to come to light mm -hmm. as more people kind of come and share their research and their knowledge of Anlo um, through the exhibition and through the book. But um, what I love about this is that it really, it really shows a different side of Anne Lowe's work. So much of it was these kind of perfect white brides, like, you know, perfect brides and their portraits are debutantes. But this is a lot more kind of vernacular. You see movement in this. She didn't do a lot of black or dark colored things. So much of her things were white because of, you know, this, these types of occasions. So I really love that how we can complicate the idea of respectability even through kind of a figure as kind of perfectly respectable as low. I mean, I think that's one of the major interventions of your exhibition. I think often when people think of Anne Lowe, they think of the, the work that she did for the DuPonts and for, you know, Jacqueline Kennedy. But she had black clients and she had a racial consciousness. So I think, I think that's one important thing that you highlight in the exhibition. And I like that you sort of put, um, is it Elizabeth Mance? Yes. You that part of the exhibition is sort of foregrounded, sort of give, given center stage. So Elizabeth Mance is, was her client, um, who was a, she was a pianist, um, but that was a really, a much later client that she had in 1968, who she made her wedding dress for. Um, so thinking about respectability in the 1950s, let's go back again to this idea of the count, a counter, a counter conversation, a counter dialogue. And I think Malcolm X in some ways really embodies, I mean, really, a, set up as an opposition to Martin Luther King. And in some ways, his style also speaks to that. Mm. But here, I think menswear becomes so subtle mm. in the, the mid-century. But tell, talk to me about Malcolm X and his, his presentation. I mean, he had an interesting style evolution. You know, you think about his earlier years, and he was wearing zoot suits, and he um, would, you know, wore a conch, which is like a sort of slick back pompadour as hairstyle that was associated with like subculture and um, rebelliousness. And he sort of, once he sort of became radicalized, he started wearing suiting. And you see him sort of dressing in some ways more respectably. But I also, because, you know, of, um, 
because of his specific radicalization, you see a real conservatism in that, in kind of his religious, his religion and, you know, his forms of protest. I think that there's a really interesting juxtaposition of how he dressed and his politics and how those things come together in such, in very, very subtle ways compared to Martin Luther King. Hmm. I often think about, again, bringing it back to like a 21st century example, but Cornel West and how he styles himself is sort of a mixture of a little bit of Frederick Douglass with a little bit of Malcolm X. And I think that's why these images are so important because they do exist in our contemporary society and I think they do have a lot of cultural weight. So I also wanted to bring up in this idea of kind of pushing back against respectability, I think Eartha Kitt is a really, a really beautiful example of that. Um, she was obviously, I mean, gorgeous and so and so well embodied this like beautiful mid-century fashion, but she was such a radical person. And her career really suffered for it. Absolutely. Um, she had to move to Europe. I mean, she spoke an, out in, um, as she was an actress and she saw a lot of success, mainstream success, um, but she spoke out um, in defense of civil rights in a really public way and, you know, she, her career was, was ended. And so I think that this idea of kind of respectability um, and kind of portraying this perfect kind of mid-century image really speaks in, in, you know, again, you have to learn more about kind of the people. All these images seem so perfect, but there's so many depths and layers to kind of their, their self-presentations versus um, their actions. So now we are gonna talk a little bit about SNCC. So first, tell us what SNCC is. SNCC is a, uh, uh, Contemporaries of the Black Panther Party, but the, instead of working in urban areas, they were working more so um, in, the, in the rural American South. And SNCC um, members wore um, denim in solidarity with farm workers and sharecroppers. And of course, many of these SNCC members were well-educated, middle-class African-Americans. So to don the, the apparel of agricultural laborers was a real intervention. And so when Jonathan was saying that, like, you know, these SNCC members were also at the, the March for Civil Rights, um, but these photographs were much less circulated, that was on purpose, because this was seen as um, it was working class, it was casual, it wasn't Sunday best. And many of the female SNCC members wore their hair natural. Yeah, which was a huge kind of statement um, in the 1950s. So in addition to SNCC, we have the Black Panthers. And I think you see m many fewer images of women Black Panthers than men. Um, but talk to us about this kind of look. But by now we're in the 60s, mm. going into the 70s. So what has changed between SNCC and this image? Yeah, I mean, black, the Black Panther uniform was two things. It often went Afrocentric, so wearing daishikis or kente cloth or even wax prints. But in this case, it was uh, all black. And it was normally it was an all black outfit leather jacket maybe, often patches, a black beret. And I think there are a number of references. I, I think about Beats and how they often wore berets. I think about like Marlon Brando and like the leather jacket. Um, in terms of like for women, Miriam Makiba or Nina Simone wearing your hair natural, um, Cuban revolutionaries and the way mm -hmm. in which they wore um, berets. Um, Dizzy Gillespie and the way he wore a beret. So it was like a pastiche of different subcultural elements that made the Black Panther uniform. And I think their styling is so modern because of that. They're really pulling from popular culture as well as kind of these political movements to create a look that really had so much, it had so much movement in culture. The look of the Black Panthers was such a defining part of kind of how they presented. And even today it's, it's referenced the Black Panther uniform. Even in the movie Black Panther, I think that in subtle ways they, yeah. they're, they're drawing from that uniform. And again, like Beyonce, who like, you know, is such a student of history has, specifically referenced that look um, a number of times. So that is our last slide um, in this time period, but I do wanna bring it to the present and just talk really briefly about Justin Jones because the white suit is his kind of signature. Um, so how do you see that speaking to kind of this longer history? Yeah, I often think about them in together, the two Justins. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> two of the Tennessee three. Um, and um, Justin Pearson, often incorporates like kente cloth or African textiles in, in his dress, whether like a kente cloth tie. But Justin Jones often wears a light suit. And if you think about when Obama wore the tan suit, even though in, in reality it's not that big of a deal, mm -hmm. it was such an intervention wearing a light color suit because mm -hmm. most suiting is black, gray, 
navy blue. Yeah. Um, so it's a subtle thing, but it's also like really subversive in a way. And I love the the associations. You know, Hillary Clinton also wore the white suit, but I love the associations with these earlier kind of forms of protest through dress. So I'm going to um, look at some questions from the audience. The first one is, do you see any modern renditions of black fashion being used as a form of social protest and or rebellion? Modern forms of black fashion? Oh, I, I, I think of a number of things. I think sagging is a, a form of protest. It's, it's a provocation. My mom hates it. <laughs> well, it's all about respectability, right? Right. Like, yeah, no, my dad does not enjoy that. <laughs> But that's why people are doing it, because yeah. older generations don't like it. It's a provocation. It's meant to be subversive and like to rub people the wrong way. So I think that's a form of protest in a way. I think of people wearing their sat satin bonnets mm -hmm. in public, I think is a form of protest. Again, wearing your inside clothes outside is a form of like, fuck you. Yeah. Can I say that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We'll edit the video. Um, <laughs> something that I would say that I was looking today, you came in, is your Telfar bag. Mm. And I really love that as a sign of protest because it's, it's so infiltrated into the mainstream, but it's really about this protest of the fashion system. Mm. And it's coming from a black maker who is trying to democratize fashion um, in interesting ways. And of course, there's only so, so, much you, so many ways you can do that, but um, I really like that as a statement of kind of a protest against the fashion system. Mm. You know his inspiration for the bag was? Hmm. The Bloomingdale shopping bag. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so which historical figures have inspired your research? Oh, I'll let you go. Oh, um, I mean, I, most of my research is around fashion makers. So we talked about Elizabeth Keckley and Anne Lowe. There's um, been amazing work on dressmakers like Fanny Chris, who was working in Richmond at the turn of the century. Um, yeah, I mean, there's too many to name. Like, more, like, late 20th century fashion makers. Patrick Kelly is such an interesting figure for the things that he designed, but also Stephen Burroughs and Scott Berry. Um, so, yeah, those are a few. For me, I would go to the 19th century um, and, like, the earlier part of our presentation. So I'm really interested in Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Du Bois. If I had to choose 21st century influences, I would say someone like Telfar. Um, I like Maximilian Davis, who's the creative director of Ferragamo. Um, I like a lot of British designers like Martine Rose and Grace Wells Bonner, mm -hmm. um, Tremaine Emery of Denim Tears. Um, There's a lot of interesting black designers who are like doing a lot of social kind of commentary and a lot of social history in their work. Mm -hmm, totally. Um, and I'm at, now it's my turn to plug you. Oh. So Fashioning the Self is a digital humanities project that Jonathan runs through Instagram. Are you still on Tumblr? Less Tumblr, more <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> Twitter. But I mean, if you're interested in kind of the visual culture, the visual culture of kind of black self-fashioning and history, it's a really evocative place to go. He posts pictures, but also has these really interesting captions that go into the history. So it's called Fashioning the Self in Slavery and Freedom. Um, how does one begin to begin a deep dive of research outside of an academic framework? Oh, great question. Great question. I'm all about breaking down the barriers of academia. Um, I mean, there's so many resources that are available um, that are free um, online or also public library. And I would say, like, you know, especially if you're a student here, there's so much you can get through interlibrary loan or, like, you know, so many databases you can access through an institution. Um, but I think that, you know, in t terms of like outside an academic framework, I think a place like Fashioning the Self is a good place to start. To analyze images, we're bombarded with images so often, and we can take a really deep dive and really think closely about what they mean and what they symbolize, what they're doing, the work that they're doing in society. And I think that that can be a little less intimidating than maybe like writing a paper or opening up a book. Um, but images are so important to kind of the way, the way societies are kind of built and shaped. What books, films, and artists have been significant for your research? Oh, I hate these kind of questions. <laughs> um, wow. Where do I start? Um, start with, why don't you start with some contemporary artists? You have a lot of knowledge about some contemporary artists. Yeah, I mean, I would say Elizabeth Columba, who we both love. I would say Fabio Jean-Louis, 
who we both love. Um, I'm a big fan of Nona Faustine's work. Um, you know, Carol Walker is a really big influence for me. Um, I mean, in terms of artists, I could just rattle off so many names. Well, you are currently doing a project around a 19th century book that you're turning into an exhibition. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Funny enough, in the same space where your um, yes. Anne Lowe exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> We've been crossing paths a lot. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm curating an exhibition at Winterthur, um, and it's based on an essay that was written in the mid 19th century by a free African American man named William J. Wilson. And he's, in this essay, he's envisioning how an African American museum might look in the future. And so I'm taking that essay, and I'm actually bringing his essay to fruition in this exhibition using Winterthur's collection. So it's, there's no contemporary designers or art in the exhibition, it's all historical objects. So, I mean, I think that's a really amazing extrapolation of kind of the research that you can do, even with historic things and making it so contemporary, so modern and thinking, kind of revisioning, revisionist history, thinking about things in new ways. So I'm gonna ask you one last question. Um, what interested you in the idea of researching forms of protest through a black lens? Oh, I mean, that's a really good question. I think the way I would answer it is I would say fashion and your own body is a form of protest that everyone has access to. Everyone doesn't necessarily have a direct connection, direct access to the government or to the press or the church or whatever, but everyone has control over their own bodies. And I think that's why black folks have used fashion as a form of protest because it's something that's readily available. Yeah, and you've seen, like, Stuart Hall talks about that. So many black scholars have talked about, like, the body as a canvas, as a form of protest, um, and how important that has been for black people. But I would say, you know, looking around the campus at FIT, like, students, students practice that even if they don't realize that that's what they're doing. You see, like, these amazing ensembles, things that are really, like, purposely standing out from the crowd, and I think that that is a really important expression of kind of protest against, you know, norms and mores that are kind of perhaps outdated or you know don't make as much sense um, in our time and place. So I think that that's a really lovely place to wrap it up. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>